So I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, in 1970, a group of protesters erected barricades at each end of 13th Avenue to claim this street as the people's street. Students no longer wanted an environment dominated by automobiles, but instead wanted a campus where pedestrians and bikes are given priority. Today, the 13th Avenue Conceptual Design Project is reimagining this corridor with the help of Walker Macy Landscape Architects and Gale Studio to realize the full potential of this important designated open space on our campus. Uh, Blaine Merker is a designer and urbanist committed to making places that enable all people to thrive. In his 20-year career, he has pursued this mission at almost every scale possible. As a community organizer, public artist, builder, landscape architect, entrepreneur, facilitator, and strategist. The theme of his work is that the form of our cities reflects our values as a society. If we want to create a world that is just, healthy, playful, infused with delight and opportunity, we can shape the cities of today and tomorrow to enable it. Everyday people taking back control of city streets has been a central tactic in, in this vision. As a founder of the art and design studio, Rebar, Blaine created many of the projects that came to define the emergent genre of tactical urbanism, including Parking Day, which is a worldwide open source project, and helped launch Parklets as a new streetscape typology that would be incorporated by cities from New Orleans to New Zealand. In 2014, he joined the Copenhagen-based urban strategy and design firm Gale to open its US offices in San Francisco and New York City. Started more than 40 years ago with the work of Danish architect and ethnographer Jan Gale, the company has had a global impact, creating cities for people in more than 250 cities and leading a shift in focus to the everyday life in the fields of architecture, urban planning, and transportation. Blaine is a partner at Gale and U.S. Managing Director, now overseeing the development of the organization in the Americas and leading projects with an urban design and transportation focus. Recently, he has helped the city of San Jose create a Department of Public Life, led the creation of the National Street Service, and is currently helping city governments and private companies figure out how car sharing, bikes, and scooters can play well in cities. He is also leading Gale's involvement in the conceptual redesign of 13th Avenue on the U of O campus. Blaine earned his Master's of Landscape Architecture in 2005 from UC Berkeley, where he also teaches and has a Bachelor's in History from Reed College in Portland. His writings can be found in Next City and in the book Insurgent Public Space. Please help me to welcome Blaine Merker. You guys hear me okay? Hi. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, that was a great introduction, and I want to also acknowledge the, the Walker Macy uh, team here in front, too, who are partners in this, in this project, and are going to be also presenting and speaking soon. soon. Yeah. Um, I just want to start with a question. Um, where do you like to go on vacation? Um, I know where I like to go. I like to often, oops, to go back to the first slide. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you like to go to, you know, romantic old world cities like Paris and sit in cafes, um, or, or you like to explore, you know, a night market in Beijing, uh, or, you know, we're in Eugene, so probably a lot of you want to go ford a, a, raging, a raging river and camp in the woods, or maybe you're more of like a, you know, beach beach person and you want to feel the sand be between your toes and the sun on your back. Um, but probably most of us don't say we would like to go here, <laughs> even though there is a European deli and there is Chinese food. Um, we, we don't tell our friends about the vacation we took here, um, even though this is, this is really where we spend a lot of time. Um, we don't direct people here. Um, but I put this up here sort of as a, as a silly way to introduce myself, because I actually lived around the corner here. And it's, it's, a, it's a lovely place, but you know, actually, it, this, is, this is Ben, this is where I grew up, and, and my mom is sitting in the third row going, why are you showing our neighborhood? <laughs> but the, my, my point here is that, I, you know, when we talk about what really moves us about going to places, we talk about we talk about our senses. 
We talk about what connects us to our bodies, what makes us feel like it's good to be a person. It's good to be there because it's a, it's a place that is interesting uh, to, to be. And it's, it's often places, you know, for some people that are warm places that, you know, we can see other people where there's kind of life, where we can connect with our senses, where there's something about the place that we go that says this place is honoring what it means to, to be alive and to be in a human body. And there are a growing number of cities that are, are sort of taking that as a, as a design principle, as a planning principle. And I just kind of show this contrast because, of course, we live, in, we live in a world where there's mundane landscapes and there's exciting landscapes. But my, my sort of thesis tonight is that we can make the places we are all the time places that we would want a vacation to. Why, why not? Why not have that standard about our everyday lives? So this is, you know, part of what we try and do at Gale is we make cities for people. We make places for people. Um, and, and here we're, you know, we're trying to make a campus for people. And we have a great group of people that, that do this. We're about a 70-person a firm. We're pretty small. We're small, but, but global. And um, we are urban strategists, designers. We're also ethnographers, anthropologists, and sociologists all working together to understand the way that form and space intersect with life and how the two, the two work together. Um, we have offices in San Francisco, New York, and Copenhagen, as, as Aaron mentioned, and we work all over the world. We've worked in over 250 cities around the globe and um, on just, just about every continent except Antarctica. Um, there's some folks in our team there. I'm in the San Francisco office. That's where I'm based. And the services that we, we offer uh, to have this human focus, primarily, first and foremost, we look at public life. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about this um, in this hour, this, what people do in, in space. To do that, we, we quantify it, we come up with strategies to increase it. Um, we look at detailed design that puts people first, that really sort of responds to how people use the space. And then over the years, we didn't always have the last thing, which says change making, is we realized that institutions really needed to change to have that focus. And as we worked with our clients over time, we found that, that really we needed to, they needed to come up with a different way of working in order to have that focus. And in our experience, we, we sort of helped, um, helped them along that journey. And increasingly, as we sort of move into an era of, you know, really big challenges for cities, um, global challenges. We started a small group called Gale Innovate that is kind of an R&D lab that feeds um, new, new services into our work. So I want to go back to the beginning um, because I know you probably didn't come here to see Blaine Merker talk. You saw Gale and you thought, cool, Jan Gale is going to come and, and, and talk. Um, it, the truth is we're, we're a, you know, a multidisciplinary group with a lot of people, but, but it really did start with Jan. And um, we're building on his 40-year legacy of understanding how people are influenced by design. And it kind of goes back to the 1960s. So Jan was trained after World War II in the architecture uh, tradition of the day in Denmark, uh, where you know, he got a really classical modernist training. It was, all, it was a very uh, sort of socialist tradition of housing people and providing people dignity. Uh, and his wife, Ingrid, was a sociologist, actually. She, she was trained in the social sciences and ethnography. And um, he, he was designing things like this. He was, he was building the architecture of the day, large post-war housing projects, really designed kind of from, you know, the helicopter, um, you know, big, bold plans. And his wife, Ingrid, said to him, you know, I'm just curious, do you ever, do you ever really stop and look at how people are living in the things you're building. Have you, are you interviewing them? Are you observing them? You know, are you using the methods of sociology? And he said, well, I have no idea. And so she taught him some of the sociological methods. And they, they ended up going on a tour around Europe. They went down to Italy to look at where is, is life really good? Where are people spending a lot of time out, outside? Because they're not, they're not doing it here. And so he got his sketchbook out and he went to the, the you know, famous public spaces like the Campo and Siena. And, and he looked and he filled his sketchbooks with human behavior. And he kind of quantified uh, 
what came to be called public life, like how people move in public space. And he came up with some theories, basic things like activating the edges of a public space that, you know, really it's life between buildings that, that matters as much as what happens inside the building. And he, he wrote a book called Life Between Buildings. And this book in the, in, the seven, in the early 70s became this kind of touchstone. Now, how many people here have heard of Jane Jacobs? And how about William White? How about Young Gale before today? Yeah. Maybe not quite as many, but it's the same. He's in that same group of people, right? In that sort of 19, you know, 1960s, 70s reaction to the modernist obsession with that plan view, right? These are folks that were looking at the ground. So he came back to Copenhagen and he saw a city that was choked with traffic and it was doing what every city was doing at the time, which was counting cars, obsessed with counting vehicles. We have to maximize the throughput of every intersection. And so all the engineers were counting vehicles and it looked like every other, every other American city. So a lot of people think like Copenhagen must be something special in the water. Nope, in the 1950s, looked just like, just like Eugene, New York, you know, everywhere had the same, had the same thing going on. So he thought back to you know, Siena and he told, he told people in Copenhagen about his vision of what he had seen in, in Italy. And they all said, yes, but we're not Italian. It can't happen here. But he was able to kind of get city leaders to try really some small things. And I think this is the important thing is it was small moves at first, very small. So it was the pedestrianization of one street, Struit. Very hard to say for me as an American. Uh, Struit in 1962. They pedestrianized it, but they didn't just sort of stop there with closing it off to cars. They started measuring, Jan and his students, still in the architecture department at the university, started measuring how people were using the space after it got closed. This is, you know, 40, 50 years later, um, sort of jumping ahead. But what they, what they found was that um, the data supported more and more streets being closed, but they didn't do it all at once. They sort of did it street by street, very slowly, and kind of let the culture change alongside the design changes without trying to do it all at once. So they found that staying activities increased, people spending time in space. Oop, that's a funny little transition there. So they, they spent more time, the more pedestrian space was given over to people, the more people stayed in one place. Um, they found that the, um, they measured things like the number of cafe tables, they measured the number of cars um, in the inner city, and as they made small changes, people's life reacted accordingly, and they kept a record of that. And that method sort of developed in the cradle of Copenhagen became this methodology that we call the public, public space, public life survey, which I'll talk more about. It became the sort of metrics by which the city um, understood how it was changing. And it didn't just, change sort of, you know, arbitrarily, they set targets. They said things like, we want to, uh, you know, have 30% of Copenhageners, can, or 90% of Copenhageners consider their neighborhood lively and varied, or, you know, two thirds of, of folks consider the city clean, 70% um, are satisfied with bicycle parking. And they put this into their public planning documents um, so they can measure it. They also do a bicycle account now every, every uh, two years because they found that cycling is really just a, a, f a sort of a faster form of walking um, because the streets, there aren't, you know, there's the, the traffic is mixed and, and people are riding along with people walking. So what they've, what they've found is that they, they set goals in 2015 that, um, you know, they would increase pedestrian traffic by 20%. Uh, people will spend 20% more time outside than they do today. Some of these goals weren't absolute. They were just saying, we just want this number to go up. The number of people spending time outside, we just want to see that go up. And they've overall, they've sort of hit them. So some of them they haven't entirely, and they, and they monitor them every, every couple years. And what they found is that they're not Italian. <laughs> they're definitely not. It is, it's, it's at the latitude of Newfoundland. So you know, every public space you see is, has a blanket and a heat lamp. It is different than Siena, but they have found their own version of public life that is suited to the climate. People embrace summer. They come out, they're feeling their senses. They're feeling their body. They spend time watching other people, eating outside, playing outside. 
Um, and that goes into, this, into every season. So even in the winter, 70% of Copenhageners continue to cycle. And they cycle because it's not because they're eco warriors or anything. They cycle because it's the most convenient way to get around. What's easiest for the individual is also sort of what's best for the collective. Um, I was just there a couple of weeks ago and it was super cold and people are still cycling. But there's these little touches, right? Like the, this, this little bar that you can bike right up to and sort of put your foot on so you don't have to stand down from your bike. It's that attention to the human, looking at what people do and providing little kindnesses for it. So all of this taken together is what we call public life. It's what a collective group create when they live their lives outside of their home, workplace, and car, or maybe classroom. And it has a couple of parts. One is that we're drawn to environments that make us comfortable, right? We need to be comfortable in our body to be somewhere. And once, once we have environments that do that, there starts to be this follow-on effect of watching other people. We love watching others. So the, on the comfort thing, people are really similar all over the world. We work all over the planet and the basic things are the same. We all have the same bodies. We walk in the shade when it's hot. We sit in the sun when it's cold if there's a place to sit, as William White would say. And we see the world from this eye level, right? We all see the world from basically, you know, four to six feet off the ground. And these are my kids, so I get to show pictures of my kids here. You can tell how the audience is doing if, if I can show this. So, you know, we're, we're small, fragile, slow-moving beings. We move at three miles an hour, or maybe, you know, 13 if we're biking. But not at 45. We're just, we're very fragile. And, and our eyes point slightly downwards and we see about a 70 degree cone of vision in front of us. And what this means is that the ground floor of buildings is super important because if your cone of vision is slightly down, what's near to you is the first floor of the building. And so as much as an architect might care about how the skyline looks, most people experience that like first 14 or 15 feet. That's the most valuable money you can put on a building because it's what people see. We experience the world with our senses, with our, with our nose and our, our ears, and we need about 1,000 stimuli per hour to stay feeling awake and alert. So I have to kind of keep saying something interesting slightly every four seconds to keep your attention. And that's why, that's why places like this, like this is travertine marble on this facade, right? It cost a fortune. It's, when, it's in one of Denmark's sort of most famous uh, banks. Nobody wants to stop there. People rush past it. It feels like it takes twice as long to walk past that as it actually does. Um, but, you know, places like this that are uh, urban fabric where there's like something every four seconds, you want to be there. And I bet the places in Eugene that have it something every four seconds, that's where you want to spend your time. We also have a pretty universal uh, set of, of human distances between us. So, you know, um, at, this, at this distance, you know, some of you in the back can only maybe just make out my facial expression. So it's maybe hard to have the sort of emotional connection with you in the back. Whereas here, Calder and I can have like a really intense, you know, interaction right here. In other cultures, it gets a little closer and more intense. But those seating distances are really important in public space. And we live life in the city, not in the boxes that sort of planners draw of the street and the building and the plaza and so on. In, in real life, this all is intermixed together. We live our lives you know, in a building and then we move down into the lobby and then interactions happen on the sidewalk. We move in and out of buildings and in and out of transit. Transit is a room, you know, a bus is another room that we occupy. Um, our neighbors meet us in this gray zone of, of sort of informal, slightly public, slightly private space at the edges of buildings. So we experience space as this unified field. And as a designer, the problem is, this is how we design space. We design it with the transportation department, public works, health, all taking different uh, realms of design. And one of the great things about a campus, which I was just talking about before the, the, the talk, is that the U of O campus has this sort of holistic view. It's one entity, more or less, that can work on the whole thing. So as designers, we're constantly getting surprised by how things get used that we weren't you know, intending them for. Um, turns out these guys really needed a high table outside this coffee shop. You know, Whoever put in the mailboxes probably wasn't expecting that. We 
need to be aware that design and user experience can be really different. And actually, user experience is right. Like in the end, sorry designers, but it's user experience is the right, the right answer. Um, so how do we get better at that? How do we get more smart about what people really want to do with our, with our bodies and, and kind of our, our shortcuts through the world? Well, we measure what we care about. If we really want to optimize for that human experience, then we, we can measure it. And, and this is the public life survey method. So I just want to tell you what, what we do at Gale to try and understand it. We look at these three scales, site, neighborhood, and citywide, and we, we measure people moving. We look at people walking, people cycling, but more importantly, we look at who they are, the age and the gender. Because often as planners, we have a lot of, you know, we know, we know how many cyclists or how many pedestrians. You're not a pedestrian, you're not a cyclist. You know, you are a man, you know, with a raincoat on who has certain places to go. You know, like you're, you're a person that has, that's different from another person. So we try and understand that as much as we can observe uh, by, by watching. And then we also look at people staying. We look at all sorts of different activities that people choose when they, when they vote to stay in a place. The difference between moving and staying is really profound. So in the spot on the left, um, 8,000 pedestrians walking per day. Spot on the right, 8,000 pedestrians walking per day. 18 people staying per hour in one, 258 staying per hour in the other one. You might look at these pictures and say the difference is old or new architecture, but in fact, it's really about, oops, um, it's really about the qualities of those, those place, the, these, um, these places. It's about that stimuli every four seconds. It's about places to sit. It's about comfort. So we see that the places that have more of those qualities tend to be stickier. Um, so we've done these studies kind of around the world, a lot of major cities. We use those to compare, um, and we actually kind of keep all this data in a, in a database, and we can look at you know, how 13th Avenue, for example, might compare to some other street in Melbourne or, or Paris or New York City to kind of understand the DNA of streets. And we can use this data to understand things like the impact of programming. You know, how does having a street fair or, or food trucks you know, change maybe the number of men or women that might show up? Um, we can use it to understand the impact of design. Uh, here in Lexington, Kentucky, we, we sort of actually f found that folks wanted a splash pad, but we wanted to see how good that splash pad was at mixing different neighborhood folks together. Or we can understand different planning decisions kind of over time, like they did in Copenhagen. Public life has some really tangible benefits, too. It, it, it's um, tied to, of course, things like physical health, so just urban design alone and um, creating a city environment that can allow people to walk will account for 90 minutes, uh, a, a 90 minutes a week of the 180 minutes that you need to stay healthy. So urban design alone can account for half of population health, basically. And in a time when we're like increasingly, we have more and more people who have diabetes, this is super important. Um, we find that Removing an hour from your commute, um, you know, if you could walk it instead of um, having to drive on the freeway, produces the equivalent of a 40% pay increase in happiness. And there's something really interesting that happens around sort of diversity and equity um, when public life is strong. And it's not simple, actually. You would, I don't want to say that sort of you put everybody together in public and it's just happy and everybody's accept, accepting of each other, because we, we know that's not true. Um, there's a, a researcher um, at, at uh, Princeton, Ryan Enos, who has done some research to show that when different groups uh, live close to each other, enough to see each other but not mix, but not have any occasion to kind of cohabitate the same space or be in the same schools, that actually prejudice goes up. And so, you know, you see, this is maybe intuitive where you see neighborhoods that are changing and then maybe the people who, who have been there longer start to get very worried. Whereas if there's institutions that can keep, you know, new folks integrated, um, that is less. And public space and public life have a really critical role to play there. Of course, there's um, benefits in terms of public safety and sense of security. Um, there's, you know, when there's more life on the streets, obviously, uh, the business is staying open longer. There's you know, a perception of safety and, and possibly actual safety too. Jane Jacobs has a lot of great you know, observations and writing on that. 
And the sustainability factor is, is super important too, right? Public life happens where there is intensity and people. And if for some work we're doing in San Jose, we found that just, again, urban design, walkability, and public life could help the city of San Jose meet their CO2 reduction targets by one third. So, it, you know, one doesn't necessarily completely drive the other, but there are things that you start to see happen at the same time. So reducing carbon emission can happen at the same time as public life can increase. So this is this like wonderful world of our imaginations. And it's funny, you actually see it more in the in sort of in the imagination or in, in the media than maybe in real life. This is from Black Panther city of Wakanda, but I always think it's like the best public life street you could have. Um, okay, so that's a, like a quick, a quick kind of primer on public life. And I want to sort of take this in a little bit different direction now to Aaron's story about 1970 and folks taking back the street um, on 13th. Does anyone, was anyone here when that happened? Does anyone remember it? The gentleman in the third row. Hi, Dad. <laughs> yeah, so, so I didn't know about this uh, until, until this, this visit, but as Aaron said, apparently a very small group, I would have been afraid to be in this group of people, it's so small, were able to shut 13th down and demand more pedestrian and bike facilities. So I think we owe them a moment of gratitude. So thank you, whoever you are. <laughs> um, and this had a funny moment for me, this moment of resonance, because um, as Aaron mentioned, I, I started a, a, an art and design collective in, in the early 2000s after grad school called Rebar. And uh, one of our early projects was something called parking, where we took a single metered parking space and converted it into a park for a couple hours. And we fed the meter and we uh, put some pictures of it on the internet and we thought we were pretty clever because we you know, did this funny thing. And, um, it got sort of blown up on blogs all over the place. We started getting uh, people writing us from Italy and Australia, hey, can you come and do this in our, in our city? And having spent the $500 we had to do that one in San Francisco, we couldn't, but we, so we decided we'd just create a PDF about how to do it, and we put that online. And we were sort of thinking about the open source software movement, you know, if you can just open source the code, it could go anywhere. And we embedded sort of the values of the event in what we wrote and put it out. And the next year, it, it felt like a lot of people wanted to do it. And so we created this thing called Parking Day. And it then happened every year and still happens around the world where people feed the meter and convert these little parking spaces into parks. Um, so it's happened all over the place. Uh, it's, I think it's happened in Eugene. Anyone here participated in Parking Day? Cool. Thank you. Um, and then. What was really interesting about this is, and this is sort of where I started thinking about the difference between tactics and strategies, is that that was really a tactic, you know, that was a sort of a reaction to a, to a opportunity. But the planning department in San Francisco said, hey, we, this is super interesting, we wanna figure out how to make this permanent. And we worked with them to come up with um, a permitting structure and sort of a design vocabulary with, with, with many others to create the parklet program. And that, the, the, that permitting and the, the design guidelines for that have propagated out to a lot of other cities around the world and have started to become a new design typology for streets where we really haven't seen anything new in like you know, many decades. So this is, it's just really interesting and it's a system rather than just a tactic. So kind of now shifting to some projects that show some of the, these ideas in practice, I wanna, I wanna tell you about Times Square because this was really the same idea kind of on steroids. And in the, in the course of my life, this was, you know, Rebar was sort of, we were doing this, and then I heard about these folks at Gale who were working on Times Square, and they said, we wanna talk to you, we're doing something like that parklet thing, only here, and it's, it's a little more complicated. So in, in 2000, 2009, um, the city of New York had, had developed some planning frameworks, uh, one of them being Greener Greater New York, which was kind of a vision for New York City that was laced with green infrastructure where everyone had access to parks, super ambitious. Uh, Michael Bloomberg was the mayor, uh, Jeanette Seidek Khan, um, who's transportation commissioner to his left. Uh, she went to Copenhagen and rode bikes around with Amanda Burden and, and, and Yangale, actually. 
and came back to New York and said, this is really cool, how do we make more of that in New York City? And so, so Gail developed a, a, a sort of a guide, the World Class Streets, um, to help think about this, and then started focusing on Times Square. So the insight here was that, you know, streets make up 20 or 30% of the city. It's a lot. It's the single biggest feature of a city by, by sort of land area is the streets. Um, but they also account for maybe 80% of the open space. So much more than parks, right? But we ask parks to do so much, and we really ask streets to do like one thing, which is move people around, and maybe, or maybe just move cars around. So really, can streets do a lot more? And when we look at the uh, cities in the US, actually what we see is that most, most cities are below standard in terms of, of uh, open space amenities. People can't, residents can't reach the amenities uh, uh, for like parks and open space. And of course that is even worse, kind of the lower income you get. So is there, is there sort of like a win-win here? Can you have streets kind of help provide some of that um, recreation amenity that people can't get to. So we collected a lot of data about Times Square. We found out that basically there were like 18 Rockefeller centers just in the Times Square Broadway area that were in places that weren't entirely used by cars, if we could reconfigure it. But we needed some data to support that a little bit more because Michael Bloomberg is obviously super, you know, he says, uh, what is it, um, trust in God, but for everything else, demand statistics, something like that. So what we found though was, and we, so we gathered a lot of data, right? And, but what we actually we found was one thing, was one thing was what actually sort of moved politically was that 10% of Times Square at the time was pedestrian, folk, pedestrian designed, and 90% was given over to cars, and yet 90% of the users were pedestrians, and only 10% were drivers. Like, you couldn't hope for better symmetry in the results. We definitely didn't round to make that happen. But, um, so that one piece of data gave, gave the administration the courage to try this, which was just a quick and dirty reconfiguration of Times Square using paint and bollards and um, tables and chairs. And it, I don't know if anyone saw Times Square during this brief window, but it was really janky at the beginning. They, they went and got a bunch of chairs from Costco, and you know, they, they looked horrible. <laughs> and, and the thing is, New Yorkers, right? Like they were, you know, like the New Yorkers' first reaction was, this sucks, you know? Like these, there need to be better chairs. But it became kind of a meme, which was cool, <laughs> you know? Um, and it was it's really just kind of this tactical urbanism, you know? I mean, it was like, let's just try it. And so this happened in like, you know, like two months, just, you know, overnight. Um, but you know, really what changed was how people experienced it. Suddenly people got to be in a space that they never um, had been in before. And so I'm skipping past many stages. There was various design iterations and just in the last uh, four years, I think, it has been redesigned and rebuilt by um, great talented architects who, who created this beautiful plaza. There's like lights that twinkle in the plaza and it's made of granite and beautiful stone. You could have never done this if you hadn't gone through the process, if you hadn't gotten the data to begin with, if you hadn't converted it temporarily to see what happened, if you hadn't gotten New Yorkers mad about the cruddy lawn chairs. And so, you know, it's really hard to get this kind of change in cities, but something about Times Square really unlocked a different way of working. Um, but what was even better was that Times Square actually improved for everybody afterwards. So travel times improved through Times Square. You actually could drive through it faster in a car. Um, decrease, obviously, in, in traffic injuries, um, fewer pedestrians in the roadway. And over time, there has also been this cultural shift where walking has gotten more attention in New York. People are more interested in it. Um, and you could say maybe it was because we offered people an experience they couldn't have before. There was a different kind of human sensory experience that connected people with their bodies and their bodies with the city it showed that the city cared for them. Um, it also gave people new opportunities to mix in, in public. I'm just gonna take a quick detour to talk about that because I think when, one of the challenges for me in bringing kind of a Danish methodology to the US is everyone in Denmark, it looks really similar, just to be honest. And so when you measure people, you're not really looking at that much diversity, maybe age and gender, but 
other stories are not as kind of front of mind. But in the US, diversity is a big deal, and it should be. And so we, need, we realized when we started these offices, we needed new tools for measuring diversity. Um, there's a little piece I have online about this, like why designers should care about this and why they should have some tools to, to measure it. You know, what is it, how do, we, how do we actually sort of look at how different people come into contact with each other? So we kind of came up with this framework for thinking about it, you know, everything from like no contact to friends and can public space sort of function in this middle zone of chance contact. And we looked at, you know, on the planning scale, what are the, what are the um, proxies and indicators of mixing potential, it's things like price variety. So like Google Maps, you can, you can mine the data and find out like how many different types of stores are there on one block. Um, and then what are the physical components that could potentially lead to mixing? And this is where I try and you know, get my Christopher Alexander on and talk about like the pattern here. You know, is there a gradient of participation that allows people who don't want to mix to sit further back? Is there compression that kind of gets people into contact with each other? Is there a third thing that, every, that brings everyone's focus to something? Um, and we, so we kind of were prototyping these tools and we were looking at different spaces around uh, Copenhagen and around um, the Bay Area. So we looked at Lake Merritt and uh, Patricia's Green, um, Amerstrand and Israel's Platz in Copenhagen. And we tried to understand who was there, sort of how much, what was their income and um, we looked at kind of relative to the census of the walk shed around it, how different was it from who you would expect to be there. So, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna draw any conclusions from this, I'm just kind of showing you the, the prototype of this tool. Uh, we looked at things like education um, levels, and we, you know what we found with some places were, they were like the neighborhood, they mixed at the same level of the neighborhood, and some places were sort of hyper mixers, they brought in really diverse people and put them into one place where you wouldn't expect them to be there. Um, and, then, and then in the US, because we have the census, we can do race and ethnic, eth ethnicity as well. And you know, interesting things like in Hayes Valley, white people are way overrepresented, um, but whereas Lake Merritt in Oakland, it actually tracks more or less to the demographics of the place. And then we started to look at who came into contact with each other. Have you met someone here? that you didn't plan to meet? And if so, what was it that caused that interaction? Um, so we, we tried to find the most sort of, you know, mixiest, mixiest places. And then to try and understand what those catalysts for mixing was. Um, and as it turns out, it's pets. <laughs> it's basically dogs. Uh, <laughs> and kids and food and all the things that we already know. Did you really need to study to tell you this? But it's, it's just a different orientation, you know? It's like, what if you had to throw a party, you know, the city is a party, like what would you do to get people talking? Um, so I'm coming back to New York City because what we did, so after the Times Square thing happened and um, New York said, okay, that was a big sort of charismatic project. Can we, can we put that out into all these different neighborhoods and use the same, same methods? So they, they built 70, 50 plazas in, in the boroughs and we looked at them, we measured them in the same way we had Times Square, these different ones. Um, we tried to understand how the retail changed um, and then how the plazas performed. We found that mostly people were spending more time outside. These are like places you would never necessarily go to. They're not like super, you know, touristy neighborhoods. Um, the people who lack open space benefited more from having these plazas, as you would expect. If you don't have a yard, you use this. Um, people, 50% of people recognized more people in their neighborhood after the plaza was built. And people earning $50,000 or less were more likely to make those social connections. So that's really interesting, you know, like in terms of social capital in the neighborhood, that investment in public space benefited low income folks more than anyone else. Um, also provided a stronger sense of, of ownership, even for people who didn't participate in the, in the building process or the planning. Um, and the places that were actually super cheap to build in poorer neighborhoods had way more people. So the investment benefit here was super high for, for low income folks. Um, cool, I'm gonna, so that is the US. I'm gonna tell maybe one more, one more story about a project and then we can, I could maybe stop and we can do some questions. But um, 
I want to kind of show how this is uh, this this method is working in in other places in the world that we we work. We've been working in Buenos Aires for a few years. Um, we are doing a strategic plan for the city, and we also have been looking at a neighborhood called um, Barrio 31, or Neighborhood 31, which is a slum, an informal settlement built under a freeway next to downtown, between airport and downtown. And it's kind of the most charismatic, you know, like photographed of, um, of the, these settlements in, in Argentina because everyone has to drive over it on their way from the airport. Uh, it's super interesting. It's hand-built. Basically, folks from all over Latin America who moved into Buenos Aires for economic opportunity, this was kind of like a vacant lot, and they just started building their homes here. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. So it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. It's kind of more like a medieval city than, than anything you know, that you would associate with having popped up in the 20th century. And I think that's because it was built by hand. And it is really make makeshift, right? I mean, it's, it's folks who are just kind of making do. So, you know, sort of like sparrow's nests, the, the, the buildings are kind of, you know, attached to the underside of the freeway. Um, the streets are super narrow. And they, they get narrower and narrower the further back you go in the, in the neighborhood until it's too narrow for a cart to pass, and then they stop getting narrower. Now, in the, in the last uh, couple of years, the city of Buenos Aires, this is a, I'm skipping over a lot of history here because there's a big social history of this place and, and organizing and, and getting sort of justice for the folks that live there and trying to get them land tenure. The city of Buenos Aires has had political leadership that decided we are going to make this a priority in their term. And so they are attempting to formalize this informal settlement, which has a lot of um, risks. Uh, mostly this hasn't gone well in the world when, when the government has tried to formalize you know, slums. So they took a very grassroots approach, but a very fast pace and said, our goal is to make every building in here safe in situ. We will not tear anything down. We will just bring an engineer and draw up plans for every building that you've built by hand, and then we'll see what needs to be done to make it stand up you know, and not, not fall down. And so what you're seeing here is actually buildings that have had structural uh, frames placed on them to make them safe. And we'll pave the roads, because what the resident said is, you know, we're residents of Buenos Aires too. We want the same streets that everyone else has. We don't want to be charming. <laughs> we don't want to have mud streets. We want, um, we want paved streets, and we want um, sewer lines, and we want our power lines underground. Um, so, but there's some unintended consequences to these things, because really the ci this little city within a city was functioning as this really great walkable neighborhood. And when they paved the streets, one of the first things that happened was uh, cars started speeding, and a young kid was, was killed in the street because of that. Probably wouldn't have happened without the paving. So this is about the time we started working there and the city asked us to come in and say, hey, like, help us formalize this city well. Like help us come up with a framework that's really about the people um, and to, to build it in the right way. So we looked at the whole sort of surrounding of the city and tried to understand how the city, how the barrio, which was really isolated by, by train tracks and the freeway could really fit into the rest of the city. And also looked in to try and understand, hey, this isn't just one neighborhood. It's actually 10 different communities and they're all formed by different immigrants. There's the Bolivians and there's the you know, Peruvians and there's the folks in the mountains and the folks in the jungle and they're all living in this, in this place together and they all have like their own rules and public spaces that they sort of own. Um, and each of them kind of had actually different um, densities and different number of units and, and, and different heights of buildings and so on. So we tried to really under, break down the urban form to understand that. And then what we did was we took this public space, public life survey method and we turned it outwards into the city and we surveyed a bunch of other neighborhoods, including the barrio, to understand what does the barrio have that is really good that we don't want to lose? And what we found was actually a lot. We found for one thing, that, um, sorry, these are in, in Spanish, but you, I think you get the idea, that in, in, the, in the barrio, I'll, I'll sort of give, give you the, the translation, um, 
we have five times more cyclists, you know, than in, in, in other neighborhoods. We have, um, compared to other places we surveyed, 10 times more pedestrians, you know, 10 times more cyclists. Uh, we had streets where there was a huge amount of commercial fine-grained activity and the Market Street, much greater diversity of, of um, commercial activity than on similar streets in, in other neighborhoods of Buenos Aires. And we saw kids, lots and lots and lots of kids, way more kids than in other neighborhoods. And back to owning the street, right? The kids owned the street. They were out there, they were using it because a lot of them didn't have other places to, to be. But you know, in most cases, quite, quite safe and really way more kids playing than, than other neighborhoods. This is, you know, 67% of kids playing compared to 1% or 10% in other neighborhoods. We hired, a, we hired an artist to, to sort of illustrate some of these, you know, forums for us. And, you know, we saw, yeah, lots more pedestrians, lots more kids. We compared it with other places where we had public life surveys. Um, and basically what we found was the public life, it was just off the charts. So any change we were gonna make was probably not gonna improve that. And what we really had to do is give very, very targeted, sensitive recommendations about how to formalize the infrastructure without necessarily formalizing public life, just letting it kind of happen. Um, kind of interesting thing here was that, you know, people, they add on story by story onto their house. They start out with one story, they live in it, then they build another story upstairs, they move up there, and they, then they can open a shop downstairs. And then when they get enough money from the shop, they can build another story on top to rent out and get more income. And so the building grows along with the family's economic um, fortunes. You can't do that in most cities. So we help come up with a framework where they could continue to build that way. Um, so we tried to sort of learn from the barrio. And through that process, came up with a public space framework. And that, so in addition to the sort of making the building safe, we gave this sort of formal public realm that tried to respect the ethnic divisions in the neighborhoods and gave sort of each neighborhood a place to call their own, but still created this kind of overarching connection, these green connections down to the rest of the city um, to, to connect the neighborhood and, and make it less isolated. So this is moving incredibly fast. We, we literally were doing the public life study and the design at the same time, sending the designs to the city of Buenos Aires, and they were building building it as we as we designed it. Um, oops, and I don't have I actually don't have the pictures of the built the built work, but there's playgrounds, there's there's paved streets, and it is it's really quite remarkable. Um, but I think the best thing about this was that we through the strategy that we developed instituted a public life survey for the city that they could keep doing. So they can keep understanding how well this is working and sort of protect this, this fragile public life that, that thrived there. So what I'm gonna do, because I'm the kind of person who puts way too many things in to talk about than I have time for, is I'm gonna wrap up so we can have a little time for questions. And because I don't wanna, I don't wanna end without teasing a little bit of what our great design team has been working on on 13th Avenue. Um, so we sort of changed the definition of public life a little bit for a campus. It's also what happens in streets, in quads, and plazas. It's what people create together when they learn, work, and live their lives outside of classrooms, homes, workplaces, and cars. Um, for the past uh, several months, we've been working together with Walker Macy, uh, a, a couple of months ago, we did a public life survey on 13th, and you can see the areas that we surveyed. How many folks were involved in that, that survey? Awesome, thank you. Thank you for being part of that. Um, you helped us get data that is influencing the design team, and you may not have seen it happen, but there were people out there with clipboards. And what we learned is, just really briefly, is that 13th Avenue is on par with some of the world's busiest pedestrian streets during class exchanges. And those people are all walking and biking, pretty much. Um, you can see the mode, the mode shift, the mode split up there. What's really interesting is down, you know, here in the blue bars, you see how many people are walking versus biking versus in cars. Just like Times Square, you can see that's not quite lined up with how it's designed currently. We'll probably change that. The pedestrian volume of 13th is on par with some of the world's great pedestrian spaces. Um, 
especially during, camp during passing periods. And when there's a peak surge at 9.50 in the morning, it's eight times as many people. And this is a tremendous challenge to design for, for the design team to understand how does a place work for both low volumes and high volumes. There's also really big fluctuations in who stays and where they stay. Um, when it, 13th is really busy with people staying, it's very busy. And when it's quiet, it's very quiet. Most of the people moving um, are on the west end. The east end is pretty quiet. Um, so we, we might ask, you know, can we expand the range of those times? You know, can we both stretch the kind of volume of activity down to the east end? And can we expand the hours that um, staying activity happens? When people stay, most of the time they're on their phones or talking to somebody. It's very social. There's not a lot of academic activity on 13th. Um, a lot of women hanging out in the campus heart. A uh, fun fact about public life is the more women you see in a place, the better it's usually working. Uh, women have very good taste about public spaces and will not spend time where it's unsafe or unclean. And when you see a lot of men in a space, it's actually usually an indication that it doesn't feel safe, quite honestly. <laughs> I'm just, this is the data. I, 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 it's not me. Uh, there's some sort of, sort of hot spots for student life and for community life, and they're sort of segregated. The question is, you know, maybe can those be integrated a little bit more? Can they bring together different members of the university community by providing more invitations for mixing? And then just little tidbits about, you know, how people occupy space. We really saw that people occupy the edges. They get out into an eddy if they want to socialize. They don't do it right in the flow. Um, some of the best uh, spots for socializing um, on 13th that are off the main, the main corridor are in the shade a lot of the time. And so that kind of thermal comfort is sometimes a little hard to come by. Um, and on you know, a campus where a third of the school days are, are rainy, um, the, uh, there's, there's not a uh, cover from the rain maybe always where you would want it. Um, in terms of like the density of people staying, um, actually the you know, EMU is pretty, pretty dense, um, but other places not so much. Um, it's, it's pretty sparse. And then this lastly, you know, we're trying to think about how, how 13th can connect to the broader community. You know, how do the sort of habits of people moving through Eugene, whether you're a student you know, that's going for a run on the river or you're a, a resident who's kind of using the campus as your, as your park, um, you know, how can 13th be that kind of anchor for everybody, that heart? So there's public life on campus too. It's everywhere. You're experts in it. Um, I hope that maybe with these few things, you know, you might notice a few other things that, than you saw before. And, and like Aaron actually said um, just earlier tonight, you know, getting the opportunity to sit out in public and just watch for a while is really eye-opening. Um, and you have people biking all year too. So, uh, so I'll just wrap it up there. Um, what's the city but the people? What's the campus but the people? Um, thanks. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, if you have questions, raise your hand, and Ivy and I will try to run and pass the microphone to you um, as quick as we can. So, any questions? Hi, as Gell Associates started to work on any projects where autonomous vehicle conversions are going to create more space for city life? Oh, yeah, great question. AVs. Um, so we're not working with AVs right now. Um, and I think that we have a lot of conversations with cities and clients about, about AVs and sort of trying to help figure out what, like how to prepare. Uh, but I, I kind of think it's a little bit the wrong question the, for, to ask, you know, how can we um, prepare for AVs to come into the city? Um, but I think where you were headed with this, which is, well, what do we want the city to be? What do we want our streets to be? And how can that technology be a tool to help us get there? And if what we really want is more space, then maybe AVs, you know, are going to be the answer. Um, but at the moment, I don't think that the 
the, the jury's out on whether that's going to be true or not. And, and it really depends on whether cities insist on AVs being a shared fleet or they're going to let AVs be individually owned. If they're individually owned, the people who are smarter than me and have been running the models all predict that we are going to get far more cars in cities than we currently have. And so I think the cities that are leading with the policy to have them have to be shared is the right, the right one. But the even better place to start is let's have a vision about what we want streets to be. Cities should, should say that they have all the power in the situation. They, they control the streets. And um, then we can tell the, the car companies you know, what we want them to do. Hi, I wonder if you could speak to how far people typically travel to a good public space, say like in Copenhagen, like people that, you know, you showed in those photos, like how far are they traveling to to get there and spend their time? And then also if there's a relationship between the population density or how compact the city is and how the people who, who manage space there should think about how to design those spaces. I don't have data about the travel um, in my head right now. Um, uh, we probably have it, but anecdotally, I'd say people don't travel very far. It, people spend time in public space when it's easy to get to, when it's on their route or next to something they're already doing. And you know, gen generally, you know, in planning, you know, uh, wisdom, I guess, you know, a quarter mile is what is going to be easy to walk, and maybe a half mile at the most. But I think it's it's shorter than that. It's like what's right outside, and. Um, your other question was about density. Um, we, th that's one of the challenges in the US, I think to, related to your first question, is that we usually don't have the density right adjacent to a public space to provide that proximity. So we don't have enough people, except in downtowns or you know, certain districts, to, to, to really be on the way. Um, so what we see a lot is uh, cities actually building way too much open space, building too many plazas, too many, you know, big spaces, hoping that it'll be so great, there'll be so many amenities there that people will just choose to bike and, and go to this great thing, like bike, you know, a mile to get to it. And it, it never works. You end up with a space that nobody hangs out in. So our advice usually is build smaller public spaces and just let them be kind of, you know, mediocre in terms of amenities, but put them in the right place. And you'll get a better, you're better, better outcome out of that than you would be spending, you know, 10 or $15 million on an amazing public space. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, my question was just related to the, the Balio you're showing before. Um, I mean, uh, the public space you showed, the uh, sort of image, uh, was it a space you created or, I mean, you proposed to create or was it doing up a space that actually existed? Because that has a huge repercussion on generally informal settlements where uh, open spaces like that generally don't either survive or especially in redevelopment and renewal schemes, they tend to be uh, sort of temporary before the people realize they can do better things with it or yeah. just cover it up with other things. I, I skipped over a lot of um, complexity in the story around the open spaces actually. So one of the issues was that th there's a lot of soccer pitches, soccer fields, and those sort of serve as the um, cultural anchor for the men and sometimes for uh, gambling and crime stuff that is other people in the neighborhood really don't want. Um, and one of the things we heard was people saying like, look, we want this formalized because th we don't want uh, illegal activity. And if you can formalize it, it'll help that. So it's a pretty like, complex social situation there where is it, does it make sense to take away a soccer field from somebody uh, and provide a kid's playground because you're socially engineering, you know, what people are supposed to do. So for every place, there was this kind of balance about what we were going to keep and what we were going to introduce. And, and really the mix of kids and older folks with, with young men and women were sort of the levers, like how we're going to try and mix those people and give them each something. Um, 
but to, the, to your question, the, the spaces are really in jeopardy. So there's, it's very dense, and there's very few spaces that are left over. And uh, they're used for parking mainly, and then for market stalls. And there's constant encroachment. And so we had, we would have things built, and then a week later, someone would put up a, like we'd leave one little corner that wasn't designed, and someone would put something there. And then the next week, you know, it was, it was wood one week, and then the next week it's brick, and then the next week it's got a balcony, you know. So <laughs> this is all just to say it's really, really complicated. And I think the, the what we, so what we tried to do was to really stay anchored in this public life study, to say we're not going to, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to measure, we're going to make some changes, and we're going to measure along the way to see if what's happened is healthy. to get bikes to stay in the bikes area and people to stay on the sidewalks? <laughs> were, were, you, were you eavesdropping in our conversations during the workshop today? <laughs> I feel like this is what we've, we've been wrestling with. Uh, is there a tried and true way? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt a little bit on this question and say, so in a city like Copenhagen, where cycling is, it's a pretty mature cycling culture. And by mature, I mean, like, it's literally mature. Like, there are old folks cycling, as well as young folks. There are people in high heels. Like, I get, every time I bike there, you know, someone in, like, heels, you know, or, you know, someone who's, like, twice my age, like, totally dust me on a bike. So they've had a long time to really get used to cycling and to come up with rules about how it works. And for example, no one will ever cross a sidewalk with their bicycle riding. They will always dismount and then wait, give the pedestrian the right of way and then cross over. I don't think you can design that totally. Design can't do that on its own. Design can provide the little trickle of, you know, cobbles or edging to kind of cue people about where that happens, but that's a cultural project. And it takes time. It actually took time in Copenhagen, too. Uh, the former head of the Copenhagen Cycling Program is on our staff. And he, he worked. He always said, don't try and do too much at once. You know, make a little change. Let the culture ca catch up and then do another little change. So I, I think the punt is that the tried and true method is to do a little bit at a time, but move culture along, too. We might have time for one more if there's any other questions. Thank you. Uh, most of what you've shown today um, is really energized spaces, spaces that have people, people to be measured, things to be measured. Um, I, I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind saying something about low energy spaces and what design can do for those. Yeah. So we. So we're an American studio. We're, we're the American practice of Gale. And so we work a lot in those places. We've, I didn't show the slides because, you know, I'm like, I have to show New York. Um, but, you know, we work in Akron. We work in Macon, Georgia, um, Boise, Idaho. I mean, I can list off a lot of places that we, we have work that, are, that have plenty of, like, it's just like no one there. And that has to do with the, you know, the density and settlement pattern of American cities. What, what we say, so, so what we usually say is start with what's there. You know, don't, don't uh, to, to, to your question, don't, don't try and build something to make something happen. But look at where the life is already happening. In almost every city, even the most sort of sleepy small towns, there is some place that is going on. And build from that and start to expand it. And, um, and the other thing is to connect those dots. So the other kind of problem with uh, under-activated cities is there's often something activated over here and something activated over here, and they don't function as a network. So you don't go to this park and then buy an ice cream cone and stop at the store on your bike and kind of hang out halfway and then go to the next plaza. You're just, it's like, you know, you, you get in your car and you go somewhere else. And when you're in your car, you're sucking the life 
out of the city. Your body isn't contributing to anything in between. So, so it's about starting with what you have, building from that, and then really creating the, the network and linking the dots together. And sometimes that can be with you know, just a physical improvement like a, you know, a greenway or a better sidewalk. And sometimes it's kind of juicing it with like uh, a temporary activation like food trucks or something and depending on, depending on, this, on, the, on the place. Um, but it's a, tricky, it's a tricky problem. And after five years, we're still wrestling with how to do it. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to you know, thank you for the uh, presentation. It was uh, very informative. And uh, I'll give you a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks for coming. And thank you all for coming, of course.